Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. This is the beginning of our fall series, first lecture. Hope you all had a wonderful summer. A couple things I wanted to mention. This fall, our series is being produced by CCTV, and we are very, very excited about relationship with them. As I'm sure you know, they count a lot on community support. So I would love to have you look at the email we sent out to you yesterday, uh, if in case you would like to support them, I know they would appreciate it. So the, the video from today's lecture will be aired next Thursday at two o'clock. And again, our information we sent out to you yesterday tells you how you can view it. Um, if you miss a lecture, you can watch it or if you just want to see it again. The other thing I wanted to mention is we do want you to ask questions and you'll see on your screen if you tap it, there'll be a Q&A button. So you can ask questions to type in anytime during the lecture or even during the Q&A period, which should start around quarter of three. So good luck. I wanted to now call on Beth Wood, our program chair, to please introduce today's speaker. Beth? Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fall lecture series. We've planned what we think is a really diverse range of topics and speakers for you this fall, and we hope that you will find them thought-provoking. And as Carol mentioned, we hope that you'll ask questions of our speakers, and you can enter your questions anytime uh, during the lecture or during the Q&A. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back our speaker today, Tom Denenberg. If you were with us when Tom gave some of his previous lectures, when we met in person before the, the pandemic, you'll know that we have a real treat in store today. And Tom has been the director of the uh, Shelburne Museum since 2011. Prior to that, he was the deputy director and chief curator at the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine. He earned his bachelor's in history at Bates College, his master's and PhD in American studies at Boston University, and he's also held fellowships at the Smithsonian and Winter Tour. He frequently writes and speaks on New England culture and history, which he's here to do for us today, and it's a great pleasure. So please join me in welcoming back Tom Denenberg. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, uh, Carol. Um, can you hear me? Everyone's you got me good, wonderful, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. I'm sorry we can't be in person, but hopefully when we get back together uh, next time, we can, uh, we can all um, have a three-dimensional experience uh, with each other rather than just the Zoom. Um, this is a fun, a fun talk today. Um, I, I called it Lost and Found. It's a, about a new painting at Shelburne Museum by John Singleton Copley. And, and I wanna tell kind of an insider story, if you will, about how we acquired um, this painting and and how how it came to be because it's it's kind of a fun fun tale and then we'll get into the get into the copley and some of the implications or ramifications from the the portrait itself uh, this afternoon for a little bit. Um, the story starts like all good stories on a dark and stormy night. Um, so this was back in December uh, on the eleventh actually, a couple of days before. I'm sorry, probably the seventh or eighth of December, and uh, one of uh, our former trustees at Shelburne Museum called me and asked if I would look at a Sotheby's catalog, an online auction catalog that was coming up. And um, he was interested in the painting, it was a Leon Kroll painting, so a modernist painter from the 1920s, uh, 20s or 30s. And so I started paging through online this catalog. And again, it was about 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. I think it was a Monday or Tuesday night and the auction was on, on that Friday. And, uh, and I was looking at all of these 20th century artists, wonderful artists, um, John Maron, Charles Sheeler, Charles Birchfield, Milton Avery, um, Prendergast, Maurice Prendergast, Morriston Hartley, kind of a who's who of 20th century um, painting. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen now uh, with you. Um, I see, oh, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I wonder if Jordan, if you can let me back or Kevin, let me share the screen. because um, I'd like to share a slide with you if you can. Here we go, great. So here's our first slide. So amongst the, um, uh, all those modernist painters, there were, and I think there were 74, 76 lots in the, um, 
in the auction. Amongst all of those modernist painters, as 20th, 20th century painters, there were maybe four or five 19th century paintings in the auction. And then there was uh, one 18th century painting, and it was this, uh, John Singleton Copley, um, Portrait of Mercy Greenleaf, Greenleaf Scully from 1763 um, in her wonderful original frame, her, her Copley frame. And, uh, and it kind of caught my, my attention. Uh, I, many, many years ago, had taught uh, architectural history in Boston. Um, and so Scully was, of course, a name that loomed large. And we'll come back to you know talking about that for a few moments. Um, but then more recently, um, Scully was a very familiar name to me at Shelburne Museum. So it, it immediately caught my attention, even though it was late at night and I wasn't supposed to be looking um, at this painting. And I, uh, I read the, the catalog blurb that Sotheby's had proposed for the painting uh, in the, in the uh, auction catalog. And it talked about how it descended in the family and who she was and how this related to Copley's uh, you know, body of work um, that we know. And then it got down to a little further in the description and it said pendant portrait, which means paired portrait, uh, to the portrait of John Scully by John Singleton Copley, 1763. So we knew it was a pair. And then in parentheses, and here's the kind of the punchline, whereabouts unknown. Um, and so I leaned back in the chair, actually this is this very chair that I'm in. I said, whereabouts unknown, that's, that's kind of funny because of course we know exactly where John Scully is, he's been at Shelburne Museum since 1959. Um, so we already owned the pendant portrait, we already owned the husband or John Scully. Um, now, those opportunities, and this of course is Electra Havamar Webb, the founder of Shelburne Museum, uh, in just before she passed away in 1960 with that painting, and she considered this to be um, perhaps her greatest acquisition. This was one of her favorite, favorite American paintings. Um, now, started to say this a moment ago, but you know the, the opportunity to reunite a pair of portraits, um, I think has come along maybe twice in my 25 years or so of doing this, um, and certainly never a John Singleton Copley um, portrait. So I, I, I called our curators and um, some of our staff, and then I called our trustees because we have a, a collection committee that approves acquisitions. And I, I you know, kind of pitched this to everyone saying, you know, I know this is probably the worst time in the history of the museum to be uh, proposing the acquisition of a painting, but I don't see how we can let this go by us without uh, serious serious consideration. So we got the approval uh, of the uh, of the board of trustees, and uh, and we went after um, the painting. Now the reason I wanted that painting, the reason we went after the painting, is um, it fits a number of kind of holes, if you will, or fills lacunas in the American paintings collection of Shelburne Museum. And I wanna talk about uh, that a little bit. I know you're all familiar with Shelburne Museum, um, founded in 1947 by Electra Havemeyer Webb to be what she called a educational project buried and alive, where she moved all these buildings from upstate uh, New York and Vermont onto the, the grounds of, of our, uh, our museum. Um, and um, I know you're all somewhat familiar with the story of Electra Havemeyer Webb. We've talked about this with, uh, with this group um, before, um, but Electra Webb, of course, on the left is a little girl in the, the lap of her mother, um, Louisine Havemeyer, um, in this wonderful Mary Cassatt uh, pastel, which I think is kind of the ground zero, if you will, for understanding Shelburne Museum. It's kind of the ur text for understanding uh, Shelburne Museum, um, because of course, uh, Louisine Havemeyer was a great collector of French Impressionism, and she and her husband uh, were grand friends of Mary Cassatt, and they traveled to Paris in the uh, 1870s and, and bought Impressionist paintings right out of the artist's studio, creating what was then the collection, still actually, still the collection of record of French Impressionism um, in America at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Every generation, as we know, um, those of us who either have kids or are kids, uh, every generation knows that we tend to reject the aesthetic and interest of our parents and go our own way. And of course, young Electra did, did very, just that um, by not becoming interested in Impressionism or old masters, but collecting Americana, um, rather famously as a teenage girl, bringing home what we used to call a cigar store Indian or a tobacco store sign, um, presenting it to her mother. Her mother looked at her and said, oh, Electra, what have you done? So this idea that even just collecting American uh, material culture or antiques or decorative arts was somehow um, you know, inappropriate in the family um, she grew up in. So we have a young girl on the left who grew up um, to found uh, 
Shelburne Museum. And of course, as we all know, uh, Shelburne Museum is a series of these immersive experiences with objects, both fine art and quotidian everyday objects from the 18th and 19th century. Electra Webb was one of the three or four women in the 1920s or 30s who really defined uh, what we eventually came to call folk art. So gathering up a great number of these band boxes, wallpaper boxes on the left, um, weather vanes, mocha wear, um, decoys, um, and creating the museum by the mid 1950s that we all know uh, and love today, which is Shelburne Museum. Relatively late in her life, so beginning in 1956 or 57, she begins to buy American paintings. Um, and with this same sort of interest in seriality and, and, and multiplicity of objects, she doesn't buy one of anything. If she's interested in artist, she goes very deep. Um, so we end up with multiples by George Dury, multiples by Fitzhenry Lane, uh, Martin Johnson Heed, um, and others. Um, and she buys these paintings in tranches from collectors, most famously from Maxim Karolik, um, who's a wonderful story unto himself. Someday maybe we should do a lecture just on Maxim Karolik. He was a Russian uh, opera singer who came to America and married a member of the codfish aristocracy in Boston, a woman named Martha Codman and using her money, um, put together a series of collections of American paintings. Uh, rather famously, there are three collections at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. They're often referred to as Carolic One, Two, and Three, um, and they're paintings and watercolors, and it forms the core of the American wing at the, um, the MFA Boston. But Carolic also had an eye for these plain paintings, or these what we eventually came to call folk portraits. Um, amongst the most important that he owned were this pair by Nancy Lawson, and her husband um, by William Matthew Pryor, 1843 from Boston. I believe these are one of just a handful of signed portraits of African-American sitters that we know. Um, and so Electra Webb bought these along with something like 108 or 110 other paintings from Maxim Karolik. So she, she would tend to buy these thing in, paintings, these things in, in great number. Um, and so these paintings came in with one of those, one of those important collections from, from Maxim uh, Karolik. And Electra Webb wrote um, something of a manifesto in, uh, in this time period where she said that, you know, one should hang work of untrained artists. So William Matthew Pryor is a kind of a folk artist along uh, with those who had um, some artistic training or, or fine arts. So she had this very uh, ahead of the curve avant-garde sense that to understand American visual culture, the history of American art, you needed to have a fairly broad representation. Um, so works by William Matthew Pryor and someone like John Singleton Copley, who we'll get back to in just a few moments. Now, between, let's say, 1956 and her death in the fall of 1960, uh, Electra Webb purchased almost 540 American paintings. Um, I mentioned before a number of these Fitzhenry Lanes that she bought. This is Boston Harbor uh, from Merchantmen in uh, Boston Harbor from uh, 1863. Um, I think we eventually came to own, I think there are 10 lanes at Shelburne Museum. Some of these directly purchased by Electra Webb, others by family members who were collecting somewhat in harmony with their mother or aunt, and then eventually gave the paintings um, to us. But it gives the museum, you know, kind of unique depth, these sort of pools or pockets of depth um, with certain, um, certain artists. And I, of course, pulled this because it's Boston, and we're going to come back to talking about Boston in a minute, so I wanted to stay on theme. Um, and I also pulled um, the Lawsons because they lived in Boston, and we're going to come back to that in a few moments as well. So we have a little bit of a theme developing within the American Painting Collection. Um, think of these two as a, a pair of Boston uh, merchants uh, from 1843, and William Lawson on the right was in the uh, in the secondhand clothing trade, but mostly selling to sailors. So he was in the sort of maritime economy uh, of uh, 19th century Boston. Um, Lane, of course, documenting that economy just a little bit later um, in 1863. Um, but amongst all the other um, paintings at the museum, there's also uh, this other wonderful uh, portrait, um, actually self-portrait uh, by John Frederick Pito from 1887. Um, and I say this is a self-portrait because we know that uh, Pito played in a band, the town band in New Jersey, and was an artist. And so the palette and the horn there, I think, are, are self-referential uh, symbols um, to um, Pito. Um, and um, so this sort of sense that Electra Webb is putting together a, a kind of a canonical and self-referential uh, 
collection of American paintings is really quite important to our understanding of what she then um, did next when she purchased a series of uh, more important or, or paintings that were more um, sort of easily recognizable within the history um, of American art. Um, I would argue that that painting that she liked best and had her portrait taken with herself. So again, this is kind of more of that theme of, you know, portrait of the artist and then, uh, you know, the artistic um, sort of production of that artist. Um, probably the, the most important painting she had was that uh, portrait of um, John Scully by John Singleton Copley. This is, of course, a self-portrait, so another self-portrait of John Singleton Copley. Um, this sadly isn't in our collection, but it's in the National Portrait Gallery uh, down in Washington, D.C., and this is from 1783. Um, but what I would like to do is just dwell for a moment on John Singleton uh, Copley for uh, a few minutes. Uh, he was born in uh, 1738, and he dies in 1815. Um, those of you who are beer drinkers or who still use cash and have um, have U.S. currency in your pocket probably recognize John Singleton Copley was really the individual who created the pantheon of revolutionary leaders. Um, so all of our kind of visual sensibility of, of who uh, created the ruckus that led to our separation from Great Britain, um, you know, the images we have of those figures, um, those um, uh, revolutionary leaders are all courtesy of uh, John Singleton Copley. Now, Copley himself had a kind of awkward an uneasy relationship um, to those individuals and even to the kind of political turmoil of, uh, of his day. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Um, Copley himself had particularly unlikely uh, origins or beginnings for the famous artist that he became. This is Paul Revere's a view of the town of Boston from uh, 1768 and you see the British uh, troops are unloading uh, British soldiers, the British Army soldiers. Um, so this again gives us a little sort of background flavor for the, the uh, adult world of John Singleton Copley um, in Boston that we have um, troops coming from the mother, mother ship, um, the mother country, um, to make sure that these uh, sort of revolutionary merchants are not going to get out of hand uh, in the um, uh, 1760s. But what's so unusual, and as I mentioned, Copley had an unusual uh, upbringing, is that his mother, he was, uh, his mother was widowed when he was a quite a young uh, toddler, and his mother ran a tobacco shop. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it was down here at the foot of Long Wharf uh, in Boston. And, um, and Copley probably would have grown up in a kind of, you know, middling workmanlike uh, circumstance, and he probably would have taken over his mother's uh, tobacco shop and been a kind of minor merchant um, in Boston, had she not then married a fellow named Peter Pelham. Um, Peter Pelham, who became his stepfather, was born in 1697 and dies in 1751. And what's so very, very interesting about Peter Pelham is he's a dealer in mezzotints. So these are um, prints that would have been produced in uh, uh, England, in London, and then traveled to Boston, and then Pelham would have been, uh, um, you know, selling them in a, in a print shop. But then he also develops his own uh, skill set uh, as a printmaker, and so he begins to um, produce mezzotints, which are sent back um, to England. So, so Pelham is really one of these individuals who's engaged in this kind of transatlantic or Atlantic Rim international. Um, economy of trading images. So if you think about a day not so long ago where we didn't have websites and we weren't all on Zoom together, and then you roll back the screen a little bit farther and we didn't have television, and you roll back the screen before, let's say, 1839, and we didn't have photography, really the way that you would understand what someone looked like um, or how they would present themselves or comport themselves or their posture and their clothing and all the ways that you would um, sort of represent yourself in public uh, was basically uh, due to these mezzotints or the very occasional oil painting that if you had uh, money enough, you might come across. So very few people would have been able to afford oil paintings on the eve of the revolution. Only the elite would have had them. And only a handful of people beyond that circle would have seen those paintings 
if they were coming into your parlor to do business with you, more likely that you would have seen a mezzotint or print like this. And so this is a uh, Peter Pelham of Cotton Mather, the great uh, 17th, uh, early 18th century divine Puritan uh, leader. And so this is really the point of inflection for us in this story, which is John Singleton Copley literally learned how to draw uh, and paint at the knee of his stepfather, um, Peter Pelham. Now, it's always a little hard. And when I was in graduate school, um, you know, we were taught not to talk about things like genius. Um, you know, we were talk taught to, you know, describe things and come up with a theory about uh, how, uh, you know, how history um, happens. Um, but it's also clear to me that there are some individuals who do have some sort of inner, inner talent or inner light. And I think we can say that John Singleton Copley, who came from, uh, you know, these fairly unlikely beginnings, sprung forth into this um, kind of role in history, uh, which uh, catches me at least by surprise, and I suspect all of you as well. Um, this is Copley's portrait, Boy with a Flying Squirrel from 1765. Um, on one hand, it's a portrait, um, and this is his stepbrother, um, Henry Pelham, so Peter Pelham and his mother's uh, child, um, uh, stepbrother, half-brother. Um, but on the other hand, it's a very, very self-conscious painting and very um, um, sort of mannered, because Copley actually paints his, uh, his half-brother um, much younger than he was when this painting was, uh, was committed to canvas. And then he also um, uses a series of these very um, telling symbolic uh, objects and even um, um, fa fauna, if you will, in the case of the flying squirrel uh, in this room. Um, the first thing that always principally grabs me is the mahogany table. Um, that um, young Pelham, Henry Pelham, is leaning on because mahogany would have been a very, very telling choice um, on the, uh, the point of Copley. Mahogany, of course, uh, South or Central American wood transshipped through Cuba before it got to uh, um, Boston is a, a real clear signifier of uh, you know, the status of the family. Um, but then the flying squirrel is so interesting because it was uh, indigenous to North America. And that's telling because Copley always intended to send this painting to um, England. Um, it was crated up and shipped off to um, uh, London um, in a ship owned by a friend of uh, Copley's uh, family or, or Pelham's family, um, where it was displayed in London. And this is where Copley began to develop his reputation as really the principal portrait painter um, in Boston. Now, there were other portrait painters um, just before Copley, uh, Joseph Blackburn, before that, uh, Robert Freak, um, Feek, excuse me. Um, but uh, this portrait of Henry Pelham, the half-brother, really is what kind of breaks Copley out um, as the leading, the leading um, image maker, if you will, um, in Boston on the eve um, of the revolution. So the fact that Copley is sending the painting to London, the fact that he's seeking a larger stage or a larger reputation, should really give us a clue that um, um, that he has sort of aspirations. We also can see that um, pretty uh, clearly um, when he marries into the Clark family. So Suki Clark uh, is uh, becomes John Singleton Copley's wife in 1769, and this opens up tremendous economic uh, opportunity for John Singleton Copley. Um, again, if you follow my cursor, Copley in his self-portrait down here grew up at the, the foot of the wharf, Long Wharf. Um, in the tobacco shop. By the time he marries Suki Clark, he's gone all the way up the hill here um, to the top near Boston Common, and he is adjacent to land owned by John Hancock. So literally the kind of the social mobility of John Singleton Copley has everything to do with marrying into um, the Clark um, family. This, um, the Bonner map uh, of Boston, I think is one of the great documents of colonial America. Um, so many figures are identified, their, their land that they own and the neighborhoods, and you really see Boston uh, as it was on the, during the revolution and before, obviously, the Back Bay and the Mill Pond and everything are filled in um, during the 19th century. So it gives you a real clear sense of the social topography in which Copley, um, Copley lived. Now, we mentioned before that Copley painted all of the great revolutionary heroes, um, 
Sam Adams, John Hancock, anyone we can really think of. Um, I'm particularly interested in these pendant portraits, these paired portraits um, that he became known for. Um, these are Elizabeth and Ezekiel Goldthwaite. Um, they were painted just a little bit later than the Scully. So this was 1771. These are in the collection of the MFA um, Boston. Not only do I like them because they're sort of the Cadillac versions of Copley's, um, they're larger than the ones we have at Shelburne Museum. The, the sort of dress that Mrs. Goldthwaite is wearing is a little more finely executed. The bowl of fruit um, would have taken time for Copley to paint. Um, but I like the fact that you see that mahogany table again. And I like the fact that you see with uh, Ezekiel Goldthwaite there on the right, the very plain um, affect or plain way in which he represented, he was uh, represented um, to um, the public that would have seen this portrait, whereas his wife um, is literally clothed in silks and lathes and, and a much more elaborate, um, elaborate affair. The other reason I like this portrait so very much or this pair of portraits is the bill is extent. So at the collection of the MFA Boston, um, we actually have the bill to Ezekiel Goldthwaite, 1771, to his lady's portrait. And you have the uh, amount there. Um, and then you have to his own portrait um, and then to the carved gold frames and then to a black frame. So that's sort of a simple Dutch looking frame. Um, so you can see the differential between what the, what the cost of the gilded carved frame was. Um, so we have a sense that this was a significant uh, amount of money to put down um, to have your portrait painted. So only the wealthiest merchants in Boston um, would have had um, their portrait painting and only the sort of wealthiest of the wealthiest could have afforded the pendants, which I think is so very interesting, the dual portraits. Um, the other thing that I like so much about John Singleton Copley and his story is there's this kind of perspective or point of view that we tend to have as historians and even as students and you know those of us with casual interests um, in the past where we're, we're kind of looking back at these um, paintings and this is John Scully our, our painting on the right and you know we tend to think of them as cast in amber or or, or of a moment um, and somehow you know immutable and what I tend to um, like to um, um, think about is how dynamic these portraits were in their, um, in their day, and the fact that they were part of a, a broader visual culture. And one way of understanding this is to notice that Copley also produced pastel portraits of both John and Mercy Scully. Um, and surprisingly, um, I don't know very many other opportunities, maybe just our portraits, where we can line up the pastel portraits with um, the um, with the oil paintings. Now, again, I mentioned that this is a dynamic process uh, in the, the time period of culture. You know, today, if we think of a pastel and compare it to an oil painting, we would probably ascribe greater value to the oil painting. It takes a little more time to produce. Materials are a little more expensive, perhaps, than a pastel. But in Copley's era, the pastel would have been the most up-to-date and sort of shishi way of uh, uh, creating that portrait. Um, I think because it's a little more ephemeral, it's a little more delicate, um, getting the materials was more difficult to produce. Um, so we have a number of letters um, extant in archives that show the, the lengths that Copley went to to actually get his hand on, um, uh, on, uh, on pastel materials. He had to get the pastels themselves from um, Switzerland. So I, I like the fact that we have both John Scully in pastel and oil. And I also like the fact that we tend to think of um, sketching, charcoal, pastel, even watercolor as a pre preparatory um, form of uh, artistic production, like you would do the, the sketch or the pastel before the oil painting. But in fact, if you look at the dates, you'll realize the pastel came after. So it was sort of a copy of the painting um, and a very up-to-date way of uh, representing um, John Scully that Copley was commissioned. Um, and again, I mentioned we have Mercy as well. Um, so that's very, very unusual. Um, she's in the collection of um, Harvard University. And then um, John Scully, who we saw there a moment ago, was in the collection of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, also, just kind of talking a little bit, marinating for a little bit in this, this moment, you know, of the pendant portraits, um, you know, there, there are 275 known Copleys, extent Copleys, and I'm sure there were more painted that didn't survive. Uh, 
the kind of vicissitudes of time and history. Um, but there are only a handful, I think it's you know, 24, something like that, pendant portraits. There are only 58 known pastels by John Singleton Copley. So they're, they're really quite, quite rare. So the fact that um, we can line these up with our portraits, I think, is, is really um, sort of wonderful. Um, this is the moment you've been waiting for, I think, which is where we actually reunite uh, John Scully and Mercy Scully for the first time, I think, since the 1920s. Um, what's so very interesting to me now, and I want to talk about this, is kind of what happens uh, when we reunite them. And let's talk a little bit about what happens when they met uh, for the first time. So Mercy uh, Scully was born in 1719 and dies in 1793. Her husband uh, on the left was born in 1712 and dies in 1790. John Scully was the chair of the Boston Select Board from 1764 until uh, really his death in 1790. Excuse me, chair from 1774 until his death. Um, he was on the select board. He was the fire warden for Boston. He was a major, uh, major merchant. Um, Mercy Greenleaf Scully, you might mention uh, or might notice, uh, recognize the name Greenleaf, and that's going to be important um, in a few moments, um, came from a, a merchant family as well. John Scully was a merchant. And it's worth dwelling for a minute just on these relationships that so many of these Boston families were married um, to each other. And that created a great deal of complications or live next to each other. And that created a great deal of complications as we move past 1774, 1775, 1776. Um, I already introduced you very briefly to Suki Copley, Suki Clark Copley. Um, Suki's father was a merchant, um, very involved in trade with England. Um, and this is where things get very, very interesting because Suki's father owned the tea um, that was thrown overboard in the tea party. So John Singleton Copley had very close economic relationships with uh, his Tory in-laws. Um, and so as we move closer and closer to the outbreak of hostilities, um, life is getting increasingly difficult uh, for John Singleton Copley. His wife Suki leaves for England with the children and then he eventually leaves um, for England as well on the eve um, of the revolution. Um, and he leaves Boston fundamentally in the hands of these revolutionaries like John Scully you see here on the left, who was a stalwart uh, politician and uh, um, you know, member of the Boston uh, Select Board throughout um, the revolution. And then the British soldiers. Um, so contesting uh, the landscape that we saw a few moments ago in the, uh, in the Bonner Mott. So I mentioned uh, a couple of names, Greenleaf um, and, uh, uh, and then another one that comes up, uh, Thomas Melville. So of this relationship between, excuse me, uh, John Scully, Mercy Scully, um, we have five children. Uh, Mercy Jr., who you see here, um, and this is another portrait by John Singleton Copley. This is in the collection of the Terra Foundation, which is at the Art Institute of Chicago. This is from 1764. Mercy Jr. was born um, in 1741, dies in 1826, and she was the fiance of Dr. Joseph Warren, who dies at the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, and so then does not leave um, heirs, um, dies without uh, having kids in, uh, I believe she died in, yeah, sorry, 1826. Um, but does not have children. Um, another son, uh, also John Scully, develops Scully Square, uh, which we'll talk about in a few moments. Another daughter, Priscilla, marries Thomas Melville. Thomas Melville dressed up as a Mohawk Indian and threw John Singleton Copley's father-in-law's tea into Boston Harbor. So I, I hope I'm conveying somewhat of the complexities of these personal and professional relationships. And then Thomas Melville and Priscilla Scully Melville, of course, became the parents of one Herman Melville, um, that obscure writer of sea fiction who brought us Moby Dick um, in the 19th century. So John and Mercy Scully beget um, Priscilla, who beget uh, Herman Melville. And then the other John Scully, of course, develops the family property. Um, repeatedly in the 19th century. So it eventually becomes the Scully Square that some of us uh, can perhaps remember, but others know as being um, fundamentally under government center uh, in Boston um, today. 
I'm really quite fond of this scene from the 1940s. I think this is just right before World War II because it kind of shows the, the, the seedy end of Scully Square as we know it as a vaudeville, um, uh, series of vaudeville uh, um, venues before the 1950s and 60s where it's really declared an eyesore and we get the urban renewal which brought us the great kind of brutalist city hall um, in Boston. A lot of interesting, as a sidebar, a lot of interesting technology came out of Scully Square. Um, just above that sign there on the left in one of the theaters, there was a, a garret space where a fellow named Alexander Graham Bell was um, uh, experimenting with telephone because he was trying to come up with ways of amplifying the sound in these burlesque theaters, vaudeville theaters. Um, and instead, he developed the telephone uh, in Scully Square. So all sorts of interesting bits of um, history come in and out of uh, Scully, Scully Square. So one last thought, and I'm going to begin to bring us toward a conclusion now, and then we can, we can do some Q&A and talk a little bit about this. Um, one last thought um, as to why um, I thought it was appropriate for Shelburne Museum to purchase that portrait of uh, Mercy Scully and reunite her with her husband is because we were already stewards of these portraits. Um, as many of you know, uh, Shelburne Museum, prior to the pandemic, was on the, um, um, you know, the must-do circuit for every school child uh, in, uh, in, in Vermont. One of my favorite statistics about Shelburne Museum is there are about 80,000, 82,000 school-aged children in Vermont, and about 10,000 of them, not quite 10,000 of them, come to Shelburne Museum every year. So that's a little over 10% of the um, of the school age population of Vermont comes to uh, Shelburne Museum. And one of the most important things I think we can do is stand them in front of these portraits and talk a little bit about who was Nancy Lawson, who was William Lawson, what was their relationship uh, with William Matthew Pryor, um, the painter. Um, and I wanna dwell on that for just one moment because William Matthew Pryor was from what was then the district of Maine, so part of Massachusetts, um, grew up outside of Bath. Um, and he was in the, um, part of Maine, sort of one or two towns over um, from a freed African-American, um, Nancy Lawson, that you see on the left. And interestingly enough, they went to the same church. Eventually, they both ended up in Boston, Lee Matthew Pryor painting in Boston, Nancy Lawson and her then husband, William, living in Boston. So there's some close connection between William Matthew Pryor and Nancy Lawson, probably prior to the marriage when Lawson and Pryor were in the district of Maine. But what's so very important to me, and I hope uh, really a, you know, an object lesson to all of us today in society right now, was the fact that William Matthew Pryor, as I mentioned, signed his name to the front of these paintings. And you'll see the cursor there, because that was a very, very rare thing and brave thing for him to do. He's basically declaring himself an ally of these African-American sitters, African-American middle-class merchants in Boston in the 1840s, so well before the Civil War. Um, so I very, very much like that kind of brave gesture on the part of William Matthew Pryor. And that's something that we talk about, the fact that in maritime New England on the coast, you will find an African-American middle class and you will find these economic relationships between the artist and the sitters, um, which are made manifest or concretized in the portraits um, that you see here. So one of the reasons why I really wanted that Copley is here we have arguably two of the greatest paintings, you know, these pendant portraits, pairs of portraits of these wonderful Bostonians um, who were involved in the maritime trade from 1843. And what I wanted to do was be able to hang them in a gallery with another pair of portraits, in this case, Mercy Scully and her husband, um, John Scully, from 1763, because those 80 years basically bracket a sea change in American history that takes us from being a British colony where Mercy Scully here in 1763 thought of herself as being a wife of a provincial uh, merchant. Um, 10 years later, there's a lot of political trouble in town. 12, 15 years later, all of a sudden her husband is chairing the select board of uh, revolutionary Boston. Um, fast forward to the 1840s and you have the African-American couple uh, Mercy and William, excuse me, Nancy and William Lawson, um, going about their business in a thriving American uh, uh, port city um, that is Boston in the early Republic. So just that kind of shift from one generation to the next, from the Lawsons to the Scully, or I should say from the Scullies to the Lawsons, 
I think is one of the sort of highest and best uses of portraits um, as a sort of history lesson that we can uh, offer at Shelburne Museum. Um, so I'm very, very proud of the fact that we were able to acquire um, that painting. Um, and I'm particularly touched, and I'll just end here with a little story, which is um, we had um, a restricted fund at the museum. Words, I should say, we still have a restricted fund. So these are monies that were given for a specific purpose, um, and we could only use them for acquiring objects in the collection. So when we went to auction and purchased the painting back in December, we used that restricted money, and these weren't monies that I could use for anything else. Um, and so I was quite, quite pleased to, to do that. Um, and then what I was so touched is that four of our trustees stepped up immediately thereafter and replenished the funds. Um, so here we were kind of in a pretty dark place back in December in this country. Uh, and it wasn't a moment where I thought we were going to be buying a great American painting, but we did. Um, and it adds tremendous value to the collections of Shelburne Museum. And it lets us tell stories about American history. And it lets us show how community is created, both historically in Boston and the economic relationships and the social relationships. Um, and this sort of patronage mat matrix between the artist and the sitters and how that works um, historically. But it also um, lets us be the museum we are today, which is an active museum, a creative place, and one where we serve audiences of all stripe um, and all age, but very specifically um, when we work with those fifth grade students who come to Shelburne Museum, we want to be able to hang the Scullies on one side of the gallery and the Lawsons on the other and talk about this country and what it means, because that's something that is, to be honest, quite frayed today. Um, and what we want to do is make sure that we are an institution um, that is sort of building community and seeks to build community um, through our stewardship of these um, collections. So I think I'll stop there um, and uh, be happy to take some questions. I might, um, I guess I can stop the share of the program and we can always come back to the PowerPoint if we want to look at anything, but happy to. Happy to go from there and take some Q&A. Thank you, Tom. That was just terrific. And we have a number of questions. Can you hear me OK? OK. First question. It seems that Copley tended to paint married couples in separate portraits rather than together. Are there reasons why he did so? Did some of Copley's work depict couples or family groups in the same portrait? Really good question. Um, so Copley um, painted portraits because that was his stock in trade. Um, that was what um, people uh, wanted him to do. As he became more ambitious, um, and we can see the seeds of that ambition when he sent that, that painting of his half-brother off to, off to England, what he really wanted to be was a grand history painter in the kind of British tradition, like um, Benjamin West or Sir Joshua Reynolds. Um, and um, and so, of course, on the eve of the revolution, he leaves and he goes to London and, uh, and doesn't come back. And he's basically painting these great dramatic scenes of battles. Um, he's still a portraitist when he's in England. Um, there's a fun quote here uh, that I, had, I just pulled back out. And it's, it, it's of when Copley sent that portrait um, to London from 1776 at the Society of Artists. Um, and both Benjamin West and Sir Joshua Reynolds um, critiqued that boy with a squirrel. Um, and in Reynolds' words, I love this, in any collection of painting, it will pass as an excellent picture, but considering the disadvantages Copley had labored under, it was a wonderful performance. So the fact that Copley is coming from the provinces made it all the more um, wonderful in London. Um, now, interesting to me that these pendant portraits of which we only have a handful of, um, don't always actually face each other or don't always relate to each other in the way that the Goldthwaite portraits did, Ezekiel Goldthwaite. And this gets to, I think, the heart of the question you just asked, Beth, because the, the architectural interiors in Boston would have been smaller than London or certainly a British country house. And I think these portraits are actually not always hanging together in the room, but may be interrupted on different walls or on either side of a chimney breast. So, People would understand in Boston that these are, um, you know, valuable, important, and kind of precious things to have portraits in the interior. But the convention of actually having the paired portrait on one canvas um, 
probably exceeded the scale of the interior in Boston. There are only a handful of houses in Boston the eve of the revolution where you probably would have had a large salon scale canvas or you would have been able to fit it in the room. And that segues really nicely into our next question was what size do these portraits tend to be? Yeah, I should have gotten the dimensions. They all tend to be the same size. So they're about 28 by 36 inches. They're, and Copley had a kind of a formula for um, for the size of his um, of his painting. So they all are quite similar. Some are, are bigger, you'll see at the MFA, these really grand ones, but the rest of them, the sort of workmanlike ones tend to be the same. Um, the art historian Jules Prown, who used to summer in Vermont, um, but taught at Yale, um, was uh, literally wrote the book on John Singleton Copley. He uh, wrote the catalog Raisonnet on Copley back in the 1960s. Um, and I was paging through Jules's book and I noticed just the similarity of size of the canvases. Mm, okay. Question about Mrs. Lawson. That interesting that she was a free black woman living in Maine. And question about the fact that she was holding a Bible. Would she have been literate? Um, I think so. And um, also interesting, she's holding a Bible and there's a biblical scene behind her. Mm -hmm. Um, those portraits of Mrs. Lawson were painted in 1843, and she and her husband and William Matthew Pryor were Millerites. They were followers of a particularly um, charismatic minister uh, in Boston, and his teachings um, prescribed that the world was going to end, I think, in March of 1843, and um, the elect or the believers were going to be called home. Um, and I'm always a little amused, this is just my sense of irony, that um, within Millerite theology, the day after it didn't happen, um, is always, it's called the Great Disappointment. Um, so they had to revise their calendar and suggest that um, they would all be called to the next world some point, some point later. So the fact that the, um, the Lawsons actually committed their image to canvas on the eve of you know, what they thought was going to be the end of days, I think is very interesting. So I'm, I'm quite sure she was literate. Hmm. Context is really I'm quite sure that he was literate too, because he was a merchant. Um, oh so I think he was, uh, um, you know, this, this idea of a, an African American middle class, you, we probably only again, as I mentioned, would have seen that in a, a port city. So Boston, mm -hmm. Portland, Portsmouth, where um, persons of color were very active participants in the maritime economy um, and had mm -hmm. the ability to, um, to sort of gain literacy and, uh, and, um, and become, um, you know, and stature. Hmm. Okay. Um, another question sort of in contrast to that is with, with Mercy Scully, she's not holding anything. She has no real artifacts or she has very elegant clothing that she's sort of um, uh, has, has strewn upon her. Um, and then we have her husband who does have a book and pen. Very plain. A bit about how they're- very, inter very interesting question. And you just said strewn upon her. And that was really interesting because it's not a dress. Um, what Copley had were these silks in his studio and he would drape women in silks and, and kind of make up these fanciful um, dresses. Um, there's also a blue dress which appears on several women and clearly he owned the dress and they were wearing, <laughs> taking it on and off to be um, representing themselves as kind of provincial upper class women in within the British Empire. So that goes back to Peter Pelham and the sense of how do you know what to wear and those mezzotints. So, you know, if you can imagine, you know, eliminate all visual culture from your experience, there's no you know, there's no television, there's no internet, there's no Vogue magazine. The only way you're going to understand what you're supposed to be wearing is what your neighbors wear or a mezzotint or whatever someone is wearing when they get off the boat from London. So it's a very, very kind of prescribed or circumscribed understanding of how to, of what fashion is. Um, and so Copley's ability to kind of create these fantasies with those silks um, is really um, how he lets you as a sitter become part of the you know, the British Empire, identify yourself in that regard. Whereas the husband, I'm sure that's a ledger book. Mm. I'm sure he's, that's a, a symbol or representation that he owns your mortgage um, or you're trading with him. So if you think for a moment about the experience of those paintings, 
So, you know, we're all used to seeing them in museums. And then for 150 years before that, uh, they were in, you know, private hands. So they were in the children or grandchildren or great grandchildren of the sitters. But if you roll it back to that painting was in the um, parlor or best room of one of the largest houses in Boston. And if you saw that painting, you either had social or economic interactions or relationships with the sitter, with John Scully. If you had economic uh, reasons to be in that parlor with him, more likely than not, you owed him money. So the, you know, the portrait was part of the um, theater of doing business mm. in 18th century culture. So if you can think of a, you know, a great desk and bookcase, you know, big mahogany piece of furniture, which would have been holding those ledger books, the whole thing is designed, frankly, to scare you when you come into the room. It's all about reinforcing uh, position and prestige. Um, and it's in a fairly competitive sort of worldview um, that you would understand that portrait and that ledger book. Um, also interesting to me, um, Copley's women tend to be fairly fashionable, the men less so. Um, and I guess we could kind of push an argument, and this is a little sketchy, that the men are all represented in fairly plain clothing. Um, and I think you know, you can see a distinction between, you know, the, the, the revolutionaries in their plain clothing and some of the Tories in the, in the fancier, um, fancier dress. Um, so you have kind of more American Copleys and more, more Tory or British Copleys as well. It doesn't work all the time because John Hancock's wearing some pretty fancy clothes. Um, but, um, but someone like Scully and others, Ezekiel Goldthwait was wearing a fairly plain, plain outfit. Uh, you also mentioned the word theatrical, theatrical effect. Um, it's sort of interesting pose that Mercy Scully has where she's sort of leaning on her hand. I'm not yep. quite sure how to read her expression on her face, but what yeah, does that no, tell we, us? We've all been talked about that a little bit internally. She's not so happy with her husband. That's what we can tell. <laughs> um, you know, they're not facing each other. They're not leaning into each other. Um, there are um, a number of portraits of women at you know middle age or beyond, which is very interesting. Um, Mrs. Goldthwaite certainly. I suspect this has to do with at what age people have accrued capital to um, mm. to commission those portraits. Mm -hmm. um, there could be a sense of painting a matriarch and a patriarch in a family. Um, there could be a um, argument to be made that some of them look a little more well fed uh, than others. Um, so that could have some, um, you know, role in this kind of status symbol that was a portrait in the 18th century. Uh, speaking of which, the portrait of Mrs. Goldthwaite, having, why did he choose to have her reaching for the fruit from the bowl of fruit? That seems a rather odd way to portray her. You know, I'm by no means an authority on iconography of portraiture, but it's all very specific and all meaningful. And the fact that she had fresh fruit in a bowl on a mahogany table was kind of a big deal. So there again, um, you know, if you were a working class person in Boston, um, and even talking about, you know, we're, we're so used to talking about middle class, upper class, working class, you know, that class structure is fundamentally 19th century. If you roll it back, to the 18th century, you know, we don't even have that. We sort of have haves and have nots, if you will, artisanal class, um, and then you know, merchant class, and then and then people who are very poor. So um, you know, just the ability to show off a bowl of fruit like that and to reach for the bowl of fruit is pretty dramatic. Yeah, the reaching is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Mercy Jr., Mercy Scholar Jr. In the blue dress, yeah. Very delicate portrait. It looks like she's holding a recorder or a flute musical. Yeah, instrument. I think it, it's a, a symbol of kind of her gentility, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, interesting story there. You know, she seems to have been, we, they, it's often reported that she's the fiance of Dr. Joseph Warren, um, but she seems to have been living with him before getting married. So even, even this idea of, you know, the kind of the Victorian morals of when one gets married and how one keeps house was a little, a little different in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, and then he gets killed and she ends up taking care of his children 
for a period of time before they then move on to other uh, relatives. And then she ends up by herself. I think she ends up in Maine, in the district of Maine, uh, and dies there, um, having never married. So interesting that her relationship with Dr. Warren um, seems to have been a moment of inflection in her life. And then when he dies in the battle, um, you know, her, her prospects are for some reason changed. And she has, I think she was one of the only or the few women that has some, uh, was wearing headgear. She had it looked like maybe a scarf that was sort of fancily. Yeah, I think she had a band in her hair. Um, again, following British portrait conventions, mezzotints of that era would have showed um, hairstyles. Um, and some British hairstyles were very, very elaborate. Um, and the, the, the architecture and furniture in the hair would have been really quite, <laughs> quite something. So hers is fairly simple as a provincial, you know, daughter of a provincial merchant, but it's still, you're right, it's still absolutely there. Right. Um, could you say something about the way the different women were positioned or posing? They, they seem to be, I mentioned that, that Mercy Jr. was very delicate and seemed very slender and very straight, yeah. but. Um, you know, I don't know enough about it, but I suspect, uh, you know, the, the portrait conventions that we're used to, um, you know, some of them go back to the 15th century. Um, so all of the iconography and then the, the sense of posture. Posture is very important um, as a indicator or, or mnemonic or reminder about status um, and virtue. Mm -hmm. And in the 18th century, there are even um, sort of etiquette manuals that show how one is, you know, supposed to comport oneself, uh, mostly for men, particularly in the public sphere and speaking. So there are, you know, there are rhetorical manuals or, or orators manuals that show you how to stand and, and to claim. Um, so that's all based on understanding of classical, um, you know, classical sculpture, um, which mm -hmm. rolls back through, you know, every hundred years or someone rediscovers, you know, Greek and Roman, um, the Greek and Roman past. Um, so that's, that's all part of that classicizing uh, influence. Um, I'm less kind of sure about the women in that regard, other than I'm, I'm quite certain there are expectations on, you know, how they would be holding right. themselves in a portrait. Except for Mrs. Uh, Scully, who the one, the one, no, the one, the one that's that, leading. Uh, even that is kind of a that's a statement. I mean, yes, yes, she's definitely. in she's in you know in repose slightly, and that could be that again going back to the sort of voyage of life that she's at a moment in life where one can be in repose. Um, you know, if right. you're if you're a twenty year old prospective wife and bride like her daughter was, that's one set of expectations for the portrait. Um, and that may have, there's some thinking that that portrait may have been an engagement portrait, I think, um, and then the marriage never happened. Um, but whereas Mercy, who is at a different phase of life. Mm. So. Right, right. And I think this is probably going to be our last question. So we're approaching the three o'clock hour, but question about the frames. Would the yes. artists have chosen those or? Yes, yes, really good question. And there are a couple of patterns of those carved frames that Copley used. And um, Morrison Heckscher, Maury Heckscher, was the curator of the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he did a whole wonderful essay on Copley's frames. Um, there's lots of suggestions that maybe Paul Revere was producing the gilt, the, the gold leaf that was used oh. on those frames. So there again, getting back to this kind of really almost incestuous interwoven nature of relationships yes. um, between these figures. You know, Revere is the fellow who tipped off the British were coming, was producing the gold for the carver, for the frame maker, for the portraitist who had to get out of town because his father-in-law's tea had just been dumped in the harbor. So it's it's you know it's really interesting how mm -hmm. they all they all knew each other and but were not on the same size. Right. Right. Okay. I think that's all the time we have for questions today, but thank you everyone for submitting them. And, and please do keep in mind to submit your questions in, in our future lectures. And Tom, this was just terrific. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your, your time and your expertise and the fact that you return and we'll look forward to having you 
come back and talk about maybe that other topic that you mentioned previously. Well, we could do, yeah, exactly, Carol. Okay. Beth, my, my pleasure. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Carol. Take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Tom.